All right, welcome back to another podcast of the School of Why. Today, I've got one of my mentors who was able to carve out some time, one of the busiest men I know, and that is Mr. Josh Linkner. How are you, Josh? I'm great, man. So great to be with you today. That's awesome. Well, look, I, one of the things that I know recently has been uh, on your heart, and it's a huge part of your calling, um, is this leveling up that I that journey you've been on this last, I guess, a year or so of looking for what's next you know i know you've always been the guy that helps organizations unlock everyday innovation uh but recently you you surprised me with this kind of new spin so i, I guess tell tell the audience a little bit about your background and and how you've kind of come to this new find a way movement that you're doing sure well like you frank i'm, I'm an entrepreneur by trade i've started built and sold five tech companies Created about 10,000 jobs in the process. And um, I invest in startups. Uh, as as you, you also know, I run a venture capital firm called Mudita Venture Partners, where we invest in early stage uh, tech companies. Um, and and the, the thread throughout all this, this sort of weird business experience is I started my career as a jazz guitarist. I've been playing music mm -hmm. for 40 years. I still play. I played over 1,000 concerts, put myself through college playing music. I actually played a concert this week in Boston. So I'm very passionate about music. And when you look at the intersection between sort of modern business success and entrepreneurship and the creativity that happens with jazz musicians, there actually turns out to be some really common connective tissue. And one of those is this notion, which I call find a way, which is first the, the, rec the, the acknowledgement that if there's a problem or a challenge in front of you or an opportunity, that there is a way. So it's sort of the predisposed sense that, that, that most problems are solvable. And then it's a willingness to find your way as you go to sort of navigate ambiguity and, and make decisions and, and, and adapt and course correct and ultimately kind of figure stuff out. And when I've seen leaders from billionaires all the way down to, to individual contributors that really succeed, they have this kind of thing in the back of their head that says, yeah, you, I don't care what you throw at me, I'm going to find a way. Interesting. Okay, wait a second. You said something that I, I didn't, I don't think I realized this. I knew that you dabble in jazz and you'll play at conferences and stuff. What do you mean you played in, was it Boston? Yeah, so the quick jazz thing. So I, I've been playing music since I was eight. Uh, I played piano at eight, and then a couple years okay. later, I started playing guitar. I was super passionate about it in high school. I played. I got permission to play in the college jazz band here in downtown Detroit. So I'd leave high school early day, early every day, and play. Uh, I then went to the Berkeley College of Music in Boston, and I, I literally put myself through college playing music. I played gigs really? all over the place, cruise ships, every genre. See, I played Motown guitar. Blues, I did the same you know, thing with college made my way but i was like electric guitar player like you know not jazz you know more of like a lead guitarist slash pearl jam hack but um that's awesome so you're still doing concerts though like with other people or is it is it your concert are you just collaborating how's that work yeah so um these days i, w I wish i played more although I, I still do get to play quite a bit um about five percent of the time when i give a keynote I will incorporate live jazz as a metaphor of innovation, a metaphor to find your way. And so I was giving a keynote in Boston and it's sort of an upcharge, but they, 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 we did this live jazz thing where I hire local musicians, in this case, an upright bass player and a drummer. I brought my gear and we play a little bit. We use m music as, as sort of this metaphor for finding your way. And it actually is pretty cool. It culminates in, I invite three audience members to join me. So I give them like percussion instruments and cool hats and sunglasses and, and we what? all get to jam. And so it's a really fun kind of multi-sensory experience. And for me, it's great because I still get to play some jazz. Wait, so the, you'll invite people up. Is this before or after you talk or do you ever do it during? It's during. Really? Like it's weaved into your talk, like during the hour? Yeah. So the way, way it works wow. is I actually start by playing a little bit. And then, you know, and I'm like, hey, this is kind of interesting that I just met these musicians. I hired them locally. I've never played before. We had no rehearsal. Yeah, we have to perform. And then I say to the audience, like, isn't that exactly what we do in business? You know, you're on some new team with some new person and new client and you have to perform at your best. And so like, we then kind of, then my, my musician friends sit down and I give a substantive keynote. But for the last 20 minutes or so, I invite them back up. We play a little bit more and I ask the audience to notice things like how we transition leadership back and forth and how we communicate and collaborate and co-create. But the last uh, 10 minutes or so culminates where I invite the audience to compose and perform a song with us. And what happens is people get, it's very memorable. Obviously that's not a normal thing. People wow, do, but it gives yeah. them a sense of like, wow, this is actually what I do all the time. I'm always playing jazz and, and isn't that cool. So uh, it's actually a really fun, memorable thing. People, cameras are flashing and social media posts and all that. And it's a really wonderful way to weave together my two passions, which are business and jazz. 
Wow. Okay. So obviously that's an amazing experience walking away. Okay. From the talks. Cause I think about this all the time. You know, there's a lot of people that do talks out there. Both you and I have the similar calling that like we're, you know, we're passionate about doing that. But at the end of the day, really trying to make an impact, you know, and really trying to make a difference. And, and what do we do on Monday morning? You know, a lot of people have talked about that. Like what, what are we doing on the Monday morning when we get back? How do I plug this in? Right. I don't play jazz and all that. It's, it, it's, what are some of the things that you have for the, your audiences? Right. And, and I'm, so, I'm sure some of this is in your books and things like that, but practically speaking, and that's what I've always loved about it, is that you're the guy that is going to show you how, right. It's, it's easy to kind of be like in like the why and, you know, up here about getting people excited, but the real, how are we going to do this when it, especially for companies that are like not seemingly creative, right? Like maybe finance or healthcare, like they're not supposed to be that creative per se. Well, a couple of thoughts. One is the, 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 the research is pretty clear that all human beings are creative at our core. We're kind of hardwired to be creative, but you're uh-huh. exactly right that many companies and people don't think they are. I've seen studies that show as high as 98% of adults don't believe that they're a creative person, which kind of breaks my heart. Like, that, that's our natural state. Doesn't mean you're going to do art or play music or whatever, but there's always room for creativity in business. And so I help people sort of rediscover and reconnect with that. And one of the ways mm. to do it is you're exactly right, Frankie. Like if you if you give somebody some big highfalutin, you know, ethereal concepts and don't tell them what to do, it, it's going to be lost in a second. So what I try to do is give people really simple tangible tactical tools in addition to some of the you know bigger picture stuff and so it's funny i was just on a call with a client um a multi-billion dollar defense contractor um just just before our call here and they said you know you're the only speaker we've ever brought back twice in the history of our company 60 years we never brought a speaker back we're bringing you back and i said wow that was that's really an honor and they said because you gave us something really tangible and they and and the example that they gave which is kind of funny is i have a technique uh, that i call the judo flip the judo flip which is basically like when, when you're trying to solve a problem or seize an opportunity, instead of defaulting to the way that you've always done it in the past or the conventional wisdom, you just pause and say, wait a minute, what would it look like instead if I judo flipped it, if I did the opposite of tradition, mm. if I tried something completely, you know, outrageously different. And so, um, you know, I, of course, I bring that to life with stories and examples and such. And it was funny, this, you know, 60 year old defense contractor was telling me, they're like, yeah, we talk about judo flipping all the time. And that was five years ago. So it's a really simple thing to be clear. It's not like, you know, super complex, but that's the beauty of it. It's those little simple techniques that are memorable and will land. And so basically what it is, is the tactic comes into play when, when they're in, when they're trying to problem solve or there's something pops up, they, they started adopting it as a culture. I think that is probably the biggest honor in our space, right? Is if somebody actually takes something from our body of work and puts it into their culture. I mean, I don't know what would be a stronger litmus test. I mean, that is really great because you and I think are, you know, a standing ovation is nice and it makes you feel good or whatever. But the real reason we do this work is because we want to make a difference in people's businesses and lives. And to hear something like that, to say, Hey, you know, we learned something from you and we're applying it and we're better as a company as a result. I mean, that, that is mind blowingly good. I'm so grateful and and humbled by such things. And, and it really is an honor to, is the, why we, we both work so hard is to, to be able to have moments like that. Yeah, it's incredible. It's funny because, you know, I'll, I've been on this journey about purpose and things like that for my a lot of my thought leader career. And and recently, as you know, I've kind of been diving into this new space um, that's been kind of uncomfortable for me, be, partly just because of the title, right? This love your weird. And it's crazy how much it's unlocking just in the way that I'm connecting with people, it, it connects so much stronger, even though for me, it's almost, I still kind of am like, yeah, the talk's called love your weird. And, and I'm waiting for them to be like, oh, I don't know, that's kind of out there. But the more I meet these people and the more people I talk to that are trying to put these type of real catalyst events together, they love it. They're like, man, we need something different. We're tired of like the same old, same old. And I'm like, okay. Cause it's really just me being super authentic about that weird kid that was made fun of for wanting to always invent stuff. See, like for me, when I was in, I wasn't playing music. I was turning my basement into a lab, you know, or trying to create things that were just flat out ridiculous. But my imagination was just raring. You know, you talk, you and I, I think talk about some of the same research, 
what you said about the 98%, right? Uh, Jordan had actually turned me on to uh, some of that that NASA had done. You know, I think, I don't, is that the one you were talking about? Yeah, so that's like one of the best research I could ever have imagined because it, it just literally is my childhood. And I, I, I like to think that I am have been one of the 2% this whole time, you know, but how we get help people go from the 98% back um, that's really the journey that I'm passionate about right now. And, and what does that look like? And, and it's, but it does start with realizing, you know what, no matter what I think about myself as like, I'm not the guy who comes up with these great flash in the pan ideas, right. Or I couldn't run a think tank, but everyone inside of them, if they start to really peel it back, have always had imagination. And it's kind of a fun thing that I've been doing lately. It's like, and I'm going to ask you this actually, Josh. So when you were five or six years old, Okay, you may or may not have known what you wanted to do when you grow up, but you maybe just like because some people they know what they wanted to be when they want to grow up, and you might know that. Other people they they don't really remember. But if I ask them, did you ever play make believe? You know, and when you did, what did that look like? So first off, Josh, did you know what what did you want to be when you grew up when you were five or six? Well, just real quick, I just want to reflect and answer your question. Um, I love love your weird. I love that you're doing that. And there's so many things I love about it. First of all, it's authentic, as you point out, it connects to people, a sense of themselves and their playfulness that we all have, that we have masked. I think it's really valuable. I think it's compelling. Mm. The other thing I love about it is that it's almost selectively polarizing. In other words, if you tried to pick a topic that would appeal to every single human ever, it'd be the most bland, vanilla nonsense. It'd be like leveraging the cross-functional leadership skills of like, who cares? And so the fact that 20% of the people may be turned off by that is great because 80% will love it. And I love that yeah. you're having the courage to do something that is that is a little weird and good for you, man. Like, I just think it's terrific. I love it. I'm behind it 100%. Um, anyway, to answer your question, awesome. yeah, when I was a kid, I don't know that I knew specifically what I wanted to do. But I, I, in retrospect, I did have this calling to like, I wanted to create stuff. And I didn't know that meant like creating a company. I didn't know what venture capital was. I didn't know what a public right. speech was. You know, but I did, I always liked creating things. And I did play a lot of make-believe and, and, and I still play a lot of make-believe. Like to me, the imagination is one of the things that truly makes us real and human. And it's the one thing that even though AI is pretty mm. clever, it, does, it actually doesn't have. And so, especially as, as the world advances with technology disruption, I think that sense of imagination and wonder and ingenuity is the one thing that's really going to separate us and allow us to win Critical. in an increasingly competitive and complex world. Man, I'm so glad you said that. First off, so just real quick before I, I dive into that, the, the complex world, because I want to actually talk to you about that a little bit while I got you. Uh, but what, what, give me an example of something you love to create back then. What was something you tried well, to create? Uh, well, you know, I, I did start getting into business stuff uh, pretty early. And um, I, so it's funny, at my six? first business. Well, not at six, but a couple years later, uh, <laughs> I'll tell you about my first business. I don't often talk about this. It was actually an illegal fireworks business. <laughs> so what happened was and there was this hoodlum that lived like around the block from It's me, been a long I, enough time period where you can't get in trouble, I guess. I passed, okay, I passed cool. the, the statute of limitations on this one. <laughs> And, and I would like, like he was like 19 and I was like eight or whatever. I don't know. But I, I would like ride my bike over. I'd go to his basement. He'd tell me like. Okay, where, you know, where was this, by the way? Chicago, Detroit? A, what are we talking about? Detroit. This is in Detroit. Okay. Not, not the so, of course, thing, Detroit right? is where eight-year-olds do illegal fireworks. That makes sense. Right. Exactly. <laughs> so I would buy all these illegal fireworks and I'd put them in my school backpack when I was like, going to middle school. Actually, before middle school. It's probably, it must have been like fifth grade. And I would, I, I, I started selling them to, to my classmates, you know, and, and. Now on the positives, like identified a market, I had healthy margins, I had a good supply chain. Yes. You know, the downside was I actually had ended up with a, a regulatory problem because my mom, I, I actually it's part regulatory, part treasury. I, I didn't have the smart stick to keep my profits anywhere safe. So I, they were like crumpled up $20 bills in my underwear drawer. My mom goes to put the laundry away. She's like, what the hell is this? The whole thing comes tumbling down. I was busted. And my punishment, Frankie, I had to call all my friends' parents. And I would be like this, uh, hello, Mrs. Russo. My name is Josh Layton. I sold your son illegal fireworks. So not only did I have no business, I had no friends for like three years. <laughs> oh man, that was a double whammy. You know, That's I did, like, awesome. Yeah. I love that. Yeah, my first, I didn't even realize I, my, I was creating a business when I did it. I was at school. It was around 13 years old. It was a, t a brown t-shirt that had uh, Gandhi on the front. And then on the back it said, did you have a good bowel movement this morning, sisters, which was one of his fa famous quotes. And this quirky English teacher like loved how funny that was. And this was like a private school. You know, he said, if, if you guys wear that t-shirt, I'll give you a hundred on a test. Well, nobody had the t-shirt. So it was the first time I was like, well, wait a second. 
these t-shirts cost like six, seven bucks. And I was like, I, I, I felt bad, but I, I sold them for like, I don't know, 15. And it was the first co- time I was like, wait a second. Like, and, and at first I was like this secret. I was like, I got to keep this a secret, but nobody really cared. Cause 15 bucks, hundred on a test, do that all day. And that was the first time I realized, holy crap, like, wait a second, this is a thing. Um, and I don't have to have all the pieces to be able to move this stuff and make the spread anyway. Uh, but that's funny. I love it. So AI, generative AI and where the world is going, right? So there's this, I call it a seismic shift that I believe has pretty much already hit, right? The tsunami has hit. I was on CNBC actually last week. I had the pleasure of being on, on Wall Street talking with awesome. them. And the whole thing was about like, how should everyday businesses and people be, be looking at this? Okay, so I have a passion and I have this crazy mad scientist friend now, thanks to you, John McGilligan. McGilligan, you know, John? Mm-hmm. I met him at, at our Three Ring Circus uh, soiree. Uh, but anyway, he's a technical futurist and he's kind of one of those guys that's been talking about what's happening now for 10 years. But anyway, um, he's kind of helped enlighten me a bit. But this idea of like really committing to helping people not be left behind is a mm. real new theme for us. In fact, we're, we're working on a whole initiative called the ARC, which is basically a framework that we go in and help companies not be left behind. Uh, it, it stands for awaken, reboot, and create. And it's, and it's kind of a play on like, like, you know, the flood, there was this crazy guy building an ARC and everybody thought he was nuts until they were all drowning. Um, but anyway, what are your thoughts on this? I mean, it, I feel like find a way and everything you already do is the answer. And I believe love your weird is similar in, in that aspect where it's like, look, at the, at the end of the day, we have, we're going to have to be radically human in order to, to be a part of this, right? Um, the 2%, they're going to be fine. The people that are super great at making concertos and things like that, they'll be fine. But for a lot of the other people, we're going to have to be these three things is what I've been thinking. You tell me what you think. Authent- authentically ourselves, radically imaginative, and, and not only allow for imagination in the organization, but celebrate it. And then I've been playing around with this piece that I think is in- imperative, which is generosity. So authenticity, imagination, and generosity are the three unlocks for me right now, which by the way, all three are unlocked by loving your weird, but I believe that those three pieces are gonna become so critical, especially in the business world. What are your thoughts on that? I couldn't agree more strongly. Um, and, and in the world where things can become more technical and, and, and the technology is, is taking out any variances, our mm-hmm. job as humans is to, to do the one thing that humans can, which is to navigate those experiences said differently, love your weird. And so I, I, I couldn't, couldn't agree more. At one point on generosity, and, and I think, I think you know this, you know, as we built our company in Back 11, we built it on a set of principles. And there's a mm-hmm. few different phrases in there, but the one that I, resonates with me the most is um, give generously, don't keep score. And I actually try, I've been trying yes. to live my life that way for years and years. I don't always, I mean, I'm sure I'm, I fall short sometimes, but like, I just love that notion of, you know, if you, if you take the view of scarcity in life, it's what's mine and not yours and everything's a zero sum game. If you believe that you know through creativity and weirdness and art things can expand and that there's abundance, then then you you, you go through life differently with a sense of, of 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 generosity and compassion and kindness. And and to me, what what a great way to go through life every day instead of looking around the corner who's going to take what's mine. It's like just give generously, don't keep score. So I really do agree with you that. And I was surprised that you said generosity is the last one, but I I emphatically agree that that's that's going to be a crucial skill because. If all you want is someone that's gonna gonna do what they're told and think about themselves, you can have a robot do that pretty soon. But you right. can't have a human have compassion and generosity. Yeah. So here's the thing. So if I had to give you five things, the last two I would have included were adaptability and resilience. Except mm. the thing is, the reason I didn't lead with those two is because everybody else is freaking leading with those two, right? Every those are like kind of obvious. Oh, we got to be flexible and we got to be resilient, right? Don't flinch. All right. So I I, I used to spend a lot of energy on that, but I feel like so many people are there and I touch on it, but, it, but the real magic I think is, is being willing to get honest about all the crap that needs to get removed. Really the journey is less about adding and trying to level up as it is to level in and to remove the stuff blocking. 
I mean, so like that's usually the journey I take them on. Then it's like, okay, believe and make believe. And and Sarah actually helped me with that one because I love her, the work she does around magic and everything. And like, I've been leaning into some of that. And then the last one is this idea of sharing, share your magic, generosity, because that's the currency that you can't buy. Like that's the gold standard that people that are truly authentically successful in this world, they all know this one thing. And that is that there's something that comes from, like you said, an abundance mindset that gives believing that like tenfold it will come back. And it doesn't make sense. In fact, one of the, the, the kind of declarations I've been thinking about is that the weirdest concept of all that I'm talking about is that radical generosity in the corporate space is what we need, which doesn't line up with any traditional KPIs, you know, because it's so dog eat dog and like, you know, companies, and I've worked with so many companies and it's, it's much harder when you start working with these companies at 12,000 employees. You know, it's one thing to like, you know, work with a 50, 100, 200 person company. But when you get to the size of, of at scale, it's a, it's a different ballgame. And, and everybody's like, oh, we have to get revenue. We can't be talking about all this manby pamby stuff or this is all nice and pretty. And maybe we'll do it once a year at an event. But like we need money and we need revenue. And, you know, that's what, how are we going to get to that? But the truth is, and I, and, and I want to get your opinion on this, uh, you know, having these mindsets that we've been talking about, that's how you unlock revenue that doesn't exist. It's not like you're just going to beat people into it, right? So anyway, I kind of, I just want to ramble for a second. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, you're, you're so right. You know, if, if all we're worrying about is some certainty, do X, then Y, you know, that that's not a, a path to success in the, in the volatile and, 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 and dynamic world that we live in. And, and really, right. you, you know, there are some short-term things you can do, but the long-term gains are, are built by uh, exactly that. You know, generosity is a crucial one. There's a great quote, I'll probably butcher it, and I forgot who even said it, but it was something to the effect of, give what the greedy man won't, and you'll get what the greedy man wants. Mm. And yes. my observation said probably more plainly is that if all you do is chase money in short-term game, not only is it a yucky way to live, but but you're, you're seldom going to find it. Whereas on the other hand, if you pursue greatness and kindness and lifting other people up, the money comes as a byproduct. It, 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 money follows, it doesn't lead. And so those that are so focused on material gain rarely get it in the first place. Those on the other hand, they go through life being a contributor and creating greatness and double dowing on their art and, and living their weird. Like then the money just comes as a byproduct of doing great. hundred percent. The universe sort of works like that in a weird way. It absolutely does. And, it, and you don't get to really understand it until you experience it for yourself. And it, but I, but I've met so many people that have been willing to live like that. And again, it goes contrary to so many concepts that we're told, you know, and, and, but that's the scarcity mindset and it is so universal and it goes back so far in history. Well, well before we formulated capitalism and everything else, it's not surprising, but it's easily forgotten. But, but, you know, the, we're almost out of time, but I thought about something you just said with the X plus Y equals Z, or I forget how you said it. But in a world where we absolutely, anyone who tells you they know where this is headed is a fool, right? Like it, it, it is so much wiser to know that like the only thing to expect is chaos, is change, is some radical things and is disruption. Like it, start there. Let's get honest about that. And we don't know where we're going. So best we can do is set ourselves up for a culture that, to your point, finds a way or is because, you know, it's everything that was novel, every great invention that today is just like basic, a car, a, a, an airplane, a helicopter, you know, all these things that we use every day. A toilet was very weird the first time somebody mentioned it. It's like, well, that'll never work. It's always weird until it's not. And then it's like, okay, now it's normal. So why would we not want to look for the things that at first glance are weird? Such a great point, man. Like, like weird is the, is the precursor to what <laughs> is widely accepted. I mean, just think about this. Here we are, it's 2023. If I grabbed you 20 years ago and said, hey, mm -hmm. man, you're going to be 
having digital conversations through a thing called Zoom, and that's no longer a verb, it's a piece of software, and we'll just be ending a pandemic, and there's going to be social media, and there's going to be this internet thing, and like, like you have a mobile device in your pocket, and metaverse, and artificial intelligence, you would have like tried, you, you, you'd like call the, the mental hospital for it. Like, you, you wouldn't even, like, it'd be so completely beyond weird, and yet that's the world we're living in. And then if you right. go on the pace of change, like, like the world is not slowing down, that change is only increasing. So the, the timeline between weird and widely accepted is shrinking. And so to oh. me, one of the best ways to find what's next is to, again, find your weird, love your weird, for sure. You have to, and, and it has to be daily. Because, I mean, I talked about this in my interview last week in New York. It, it took Instagram, I think, roughly two years to get to 100 million users. It took Netflix three and a half. I mean, this latest open AI was five days. I mean, it's right. if you every week, whatever you were like thinking was where we were at last week has, is changing. I mean, it's 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 it, it is in, it is crazy how fast it's changing. Um, OK, last question. I'm gonna let you go. Chat GPT. What, what's the most interesting thing you're doing with it these days? Well, there's a lot of cool stuff. And as you know, I run a venture capital firm and we're looking at a lot of interesting uh, AI type uh, applications. Um, but a couple of that I've seen for, for people in the thought leader space, um, you know, one person in our community, this guy, Dan Sharkov, who, who, who works at Google, he's, he's working on a new book. And so yeah, he, like Dan. he took, uh, me too, he's lovely. So he took his table of contents. He didn't write the book, it wrote the table of contents, gave it to chat GPT and said, write me a one-star Amazon review and a five-star Amazon review based on the table of contents. And what it did is it found flaws on the one star and gave them areas where, where you could double down on the, on the, on the five star. And so it was such a creative use of, of that technology to that. help guide. It wasn't writing his book for him. He want, he's the artist for sure, right. he's the thought leader, but it gave him guidance and, and helped him write, write a better piece of, of, of art. So I love this notion of AI as a co-pilot. You know, yes. pretty soon if, if, you have, if you have a doctor and, and they're, they're, of course, you want the doctor and their judgment and experience, of course, but you also want them co consulting with the entire world body of, of evidence-based you know, research yes. on that particular topic. You want both. You want a doctor with a co-pilot of AI. And so where I see things headed is that AI will be a co-pilot in nearly every profession. And, uh, and, and for us as speakers, you know, for us to be able to do you know, deeper research, to, to be able to find those gem stories, to be able to connect the dots for clients, it's not doing the work for us, but it's a co-pilot cool no. that allows us to be more effective. A hundred percent agree. You know, it's, it, for me, even from an outreach standpoint, when I tell you the amount of engagement I'm getting and closing talks, because I, I went from this old template I had created before with my responses and whatnot to like every single time I'm digging deep and I'm, I'm grinding it out with ChatGPT and then I'm responding. It's unbelievable. It's unbelievable how much quicker, but yeah, the co-pilot, because the way I look at it is that it's, where else could we get somewhere between five to 7 billion other consciousness in one space? That's basically what it is. I mean, it's, it's, it's billions of, of consciousness people's thoughts and work like within seconds it's profound but I, I i mean i'm glad you didn't say oh i don't use it I, I figured that wouldn't be your answer but um i love that so josh thank you so much for being generous uh yourself by giving us this time uh you've always surprised me with that you've created a hell of a community i'm a card carrying member like i'm almost embarrassed when I talk about it, like it's, it's, you've done something very special there. Like I've never been like one of those geeky guys about a community, but like you guys have done it and it's because it's absolutely authentic. It's absolutely authentic. And you've thought really thought it out. So well done there. Um, where do people find you, Josh? Well, thanks. Um, and, and you, I'm on all social media, just my name, Josh Linkner, J O S H L I N K N E R. And my website is just my name, joshlinkner.com, and, and everything is there. And just, you know, as we, as we, as we close out, too, Frank, I just want to celebrate this podcast that you're doing, the gift that you're giving back to the world, that you're helping people reconnect to the weird that's inside of us all. It's, it's a beautiful gift. And you talk about generosity. No, no one better to, to, to personify that than you, my friend. Oh, wow. Well, thank you so much, Josh. And for all of you listening and watching, thank you guys so much for tuning in. And until next time, this has been the School of Why podcast.